Conversations about theology, church, and the Christian life in a world where the sky is always falling. Hey guys, welcome back to the Layman of the Apocalypse podcast. And today I'm excited to again uh, chop it up with my good friends Brian Daniel and Matt Casarilla. Guys, what's happening? What's good? It is all good i don't know if i'm recording right now guys oh i see the bar moving forgive me i'm sorry that was a beautiful beautiful (laughs) intro by the way i'm keeping this in there (laughs) we're good man we're good how are you oh awesome and i and i really appreciate that matt because you're really sticking to the theme of every episode it's like an old man matt casserilla moment where he's either like buying a gun at a pawn shop (laughs) gotta stay in character Or he's not sure how to record uh, his mic, so <laughs> awesome. Much grace, brother, much grace. I need it. To you. Thank so, you. you know, the, the, the topic today is good works and dirty tampons. And I know that is a super clickbaity title, but I did want to just explain, like, the idea behind that is, you know, in the scripture, it talks about um, our good works as filthy rags, and yet, uh, it's really sanitized, right? Like that word filthy rags in, uh, English translations doesn't really even come close to doing it justice. And, um, what he's actually talking about, if you've never heard this before is he's actually alluding to the idea of like a used menstrual cloth, um, or a tampon. And it's just, it's the most, uh, you know, uh, like just gut wrenching idea um, that he could probably come up with. He was using that word to first shock jock value for sure. He wanted you to understand just how uh, despicable it was. It's to, not a trophy you put on the shelf. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This wasn't <laughs> <laughs> definitely not something you display. Um, and uh, yeah, absolutely. It's uh, and that and that really is a good you example. Guys, you guys got to see my dirty tampons. <laughs> let me tell you. But I mean, what makes it a dirty tampon other than when you produce a work that you think is good and you bring it to God and you're like, hey, yeah, let me in. Look at this. This is amazing. And it was like, you know, it was Isaiah where they're talking about the the works of the people had gotten to the point of being nothing more yeah. than dirty menstrual rags, you know, mm-hmm. and. Um, that's where like you know good works apart from the grace of god are pretty gross (laughs) especially if you think they're gonna save you if you're gonna be presenting them to god as an acceptable offering it's like at the same time you're insulting him you're also insulting your own intelligence because you're operating out of a very small paradigm yeah. As Isaiah says, uh, he says, we have all become like one who is unclean and all of our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment, um, ESV or filthy rags. That's the NIV. We all fade like a leaf and our iniquities like the wind take us away. Of course, he was uh, setting up the, the good news. Um, but until you realize that even your best deeds are like filthy rags, like tampons, uh, you will never understand how beautiful the grace of God in Christ is. We're going to explore what that means and, uh, and, uh, and discuss that today. But before we do that, how about we start with uh, an evidence of grace? And, and, uh, and of course, uh, when I was talking to you guys about this just a few minutes ago off air, Matt Casarilla busted my chops about that because uh, that's a sort of a a throwback term to the old like sovereign grace days, uh, CJ Mahaney and, uh, Josh Harris and all of them, they used to say, uh, let's start with an evidence of grace. And, um, but you know what, uh, as you quickly pointed out after we laughed about it, um, 
it's it's a good thing to do, especially in the kind of the cultural moment that we're living in right now is to stop. And before we get into the, you know, the, the, the conversation, let's stop and acknowledge where God's working in our lives and uh, and share what's happening um, that that you're that you're seeing God work. So go ahead, uh, Brian, why don't you go first, man? Well, I got to go first. This is not my <laughs> idea. You guys went through this already. You guys, you guys set the example and then I'll follow suit. <laughs> I don't know why. I was just looking. You're the only one that was on my screen, so I had to call you up first. <laughs> this is new to me, so I got to watch you guys do it first and then I'll... Uh... All right. All right. Check it out. I'll go, I'll go first. All right. This is this how it's done. All right. I don't want to set... The, I'll set the bar really low for you. Thank you. It's like a dance off in the schoolyard. <laughs> <laughs> not to get served I know. I know. <laughs> and you know what's funny is since you know this is an opportunity for us to really display works righteousness to each other before we talk about it so that's that's part of the reason why you do this mm. um anyway so what's good um i'll tell you what's good i've been thinking a lot about and i think we talked about this before like off one of off the air one of our conversations one of the verses I've been meditating on for probably, I don't know, it's probably been two months now. It's just been stuck in my head. Like it just, it's been engraved in the back of my skull is the apostle Paul commands uh, believers to, or extorts them, commands, extorts to, uh, to be ambitious, make it their ambition to live a quiet life. Um, which is a pun, which is why I think it sticks in my head so well. Like the idea of living a quiet life uh, and making that your ambitious. In other words, make it your ambition to not be ambitious. And to me, that's the way that that's speaking to me today is even in this podcast, like to me, it's, I was wondering, should I, should I, you know, um, should I question whether or not we should be doing this podcast and, and making a big fuss and getting our names out there and stuff like that. And I realized, you know what, it's not about that. It's not about, um, for me, it's not about, you know, uh, changing somebody's opinion or, you know, uh, you know, railing against the authorities or against church or against, uh, you know, certain belief systems. But to me, it's really just about getting a chance to hang out with you guys and, and talk. Uh, because life is so crazy and so busy uh, right now, it's great to just take some time and uh, and talk to some fellow brothers. So that's my evidence of grace. Is this is all about uh, our time together and uh, just grateful for you guys. Right on. I guess I'll go second. I'm a little little dusty. Should uh, be better at encouraging myself and encouraging others. So to get like pretty deep, pretty fast. Um, you know, I, I have conversations with these guys all the time and we talk about everything, you know, like what's going on in our marriages, what's going on in our families, what's going on in our business. And, you know, Matt has given me a lot of very wise counsel and advice and just, you know, helping me walk through stuff that, that, that he's walked through himself. And sometimes I don't think his ideas are always going to work. Because <laughs> I'm like, oh, you know, you don't understand the situation I'm in or you don't understand the people I'm dealing with. And um, I had a, a breakthrough with a very difficult situation that I wasn't very hopeful in. And um, I guess the evidence of grace is one, uh, listening to my brother's counsel and not just being like super stubborn because he approached me like a brother, like he just said, like we're friends. And, um, you know, he didn't put on his like grand poop on hat and uh, shellac me. <laughs> and um, yeah, it just, it was, it was beautiful to, face my own insecurities, fears, anxieties, and just step out in faith and say, okay, you know, maybe there's a better way of, of, of looking at this. Or sometimes it's just timing, 
you know, it's there, there again, you get into the sovereignty of God and, you know, the, the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the strong, but time and chance happen to us all. So, um, no, that was a real grace moment that I, that I needed because I feel like this heavy blanket's been on me. I've been working um, as a nurse through this whole situation and this has been dragging on for months. Um, like I shared in the last episode, this started in January for me. And, uh, and then I'm holding down this, this full-time job under these conditions and it's business as usual and it's not business as usual all at the same time. And I just feel like I've been in the twilight zone. Um, and it's like, I'm coming out of the, the fire, you know, with all this smoke and soot and I'm trying just to enjoy a warm cooked meal when I come home and then go back into the fire. <laughs> but uh, I don't think the fire is as scary as, you know, people have been making it out to be, but it's a fire nonetheless, you know, so. Man, that's so good, man. I'm so encouraged by that. And um, praise God for your humility and your ability to to share that man i think that's a beautiful thing so um god is certainly that is that is the perfect example of evidence of grace because no man can um kind of say those things apart from god um you know being being uh, at work in, in your spirit so that's beautiful thank you thank you for saying it's that. the three hardest words i love you and i was wrong <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's right. Uh, beautiful. All right, Brian. No, that's uh, no pressure, man. All right, let's I, wrap it I, up. I hate that you have to follow that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't have anything as uh, packaged as you guys, but I, I guess, I mean, there's not been much going on in my own world. And so we're just trying to sort through our marriage and make sure it's still healthy. And I guess for us, an evidence of grace is in been in this last season I mean we kind of had gotten to the edge of our marriage to where we basically just had a covenant left and um, we've been finding our way back to one another and uh, I feel like we finally over the last few weeks during COVID-19 have kind of almost not just gotten back to where we fell from this time last year but we've gotten further wow and so we're finally at the point where we see why the season happened in the first place. Um, and we saw all of some of our idols fall and collapse before our eyes. And that included our marriage. And, um, and so it's beautiful that uh, God's kind of pulled us through this and we're getting, we're, we're, we're back and better than ever. And uh, it's not perfect still. I mean, we still <laughs> have, you know, there's just normal moments, I guess, in, in, in marriage, but you still need the gospel, bro. <laughs> yeah, I know. Exactly. Like, it's just a regular thing. Like it's an ongoing constant in need of the grace of God. And, and, and it's just, it's, it's been a beautiful thing to see, you know, sticking it out with the promises of God, you know, mm. through the marriage and through the darkness and being like, well, there's a reason why God, you know, ordained marriage in the first place. So let's stick to it and see what happens at the other side. And we got through the other side and we're like, dude, so many people miss out when they bail. Mm. Well, I guess we're going to have to do an episode on marriage here pretty soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's a trigger word around here. <laughs> All right. We have to wait a little while, see how it uh, pans out for us, though, before we start giving advice. We need a 10-day cool-off period. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, well, thanks, man. Thanks for sharing that. You know what I, is a common theme I keep hearing is the coronavirus and all of this uh, crap that we're living through is is turned out to be a blessing to so many people um causing us to slow down be a little more introspective be a little more thoughtful a little more methodic about the way that we're living our lives instead of just being carried about by the culture mm. and that's a great thing i mean if, mm -hmm. if if that's all that we take away from this you know as it kind of the dust settles 
I think that'd be a great thing, man. Just for us to be a little more, um, a little more aware, a little more conscientious about the way that we think and the way that we spend our time, mm-hmm. who we're spending our time with. Redeeming the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, it's, it has to have challenged a lot of marriages and I'm sure that not everybody uh, relationships, I'm sure that everybody's uh, struggling in different ways, but I have to imagine mm-hmm. that a lot of people are finding it as a, a blessing like yeah. uh, like we have as well. So depends on what your uh, your your towers are built on, really, I suppose. Well, God, is, God is in the business of making beautiful things out of the darkness and, uh, and no time is that more evident than right now so Mm -hmm. real real quick a fun fact i was at work and i overheard someone talking about someone they know that is one of these you know distress answer people i don't know what level of authority they were in the government but they said the number one calls that they're getting right now are not from um, breaking an entry or robbery. It's it's domestic disputes. Mm. They're, they're getting a lot of phone calls from from houses where family members are fighting and yelling at each other. Yeah, I mean, we spend so much time of trying to avoid one another, and then when those those distractions and excuses get taken away from us, and you're left with without a fig leaf, so to speak. <laughs> yep. And, um, you know, I mean, I know that that's, that's true, but I also know that uh, on the flip side, I mean, that's the thing about this is that it's very polarizing. It's bringing, it kind of reminds me of alcohol in a lot of ways, uh, not to sound too, uh, out there, but it's like alcohol doesn't necessarily turn you into somebody else. It like really reveals who you are. Mm. Um, that's why I've always appreciated like uh, having a drink with a brother, you know, like let's finally take off the religious face Mm -hmm. and like have a couple of uh, drinks and see who you really are, Mm -hmm. you know, at, at, you know, underneath the surface. And I think that's what the coronavirus has done to a lot of people. It's kind of, it reveals who, who, what you really have going on beneath the surface. Mm. I heard something said, um, it was along the lines of, uh, if you have a snow globe and you shake it up, and you see all the sediments coming down. Was it the shaking that caused the sediments, or um, or was it the fact that there were sediments there to be shaken in the first place? Mm, yeah, yeah. And um, and I I found that encouraging. It's like one of those things, like figuring out what the sediments are, so that when you do get shaken, because we're always gonna get shaken. It's like, how do you? I got a lot of sediments. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me too, man. <laughs> That's the beauty of redemption is it's taking messy situations. It's taking hard data that isn't pretty to look at, but it's making sense out of it in a meaningful, purposeful, redemptive way. Mm-hmm. And that's what God does to us through the gospel through the good news of of jesus christ and him crucified so kind of a just a nod in that direction you know a lot of times we're trying so hard to live up to a certain ideal which it's great to have ideals and yet when we do trip when we do fall usually we want to blame someone else first and then we have to admit our own humanity in the situation like brian was sharing i had i heard a similar Mm -hmm. you know analogy it's like a cup and you bump into me and it spills and i'm like hey it's spilled because you bumped into me and you're it's like no it spilled because there was something in the cup now (laughs) it was agitated and aggravated by being bumped into but the fact remains there was something in the cup that came out you know and that that's like what jesus talked about it's not what goes into a man but what comes out of a man Mm -hmm. you know that uh defiles him yeah well it's fascinating and and part of the reason why i thought that this would be a good topic for us i mean we could talk about a million different things right now um but it's fascinating to me as just sort of an observer of my own heart and an observer of human nature that uh especially being a, a christian um you know there is this we there's this dissonance between 
um, you know, the, the, the person that we think we are, the person that we uh, try to display to others, especially in the church, mm. and who we are by ourselves or with our family when, we're, when the doors are closed and nobody's looking. And to me, that's where I started thinking about how this must be um, an awakening for a lot of people, because it has been for me, because it's like, wow, you know, um, I'm here. The only people watching me are my kids and, and my wife. And um, is my behavior, you know, the words that are coming out of my mouth and the way that I'm acting, does it line up with who I try to like, like the image that I try to put out there? And I feel like just the days of being kind of, uh, quarantine, if you will, like uh, set apart from the rest of the world where there's no posturing, there's no playing church, you know, because there's no church to go to right now. There's no Bible study to to posture at um, like that to me is is interesting because it reveals like that wow, you know, you really do walk around with a mask on most of the time. And I think most people <laughs> I think most people can relate to that. And um, literally now everyone's wearing masks on top of their mask. <laughs> oh, damn, I didn't even think about that. <laughs> you're right. I was not being a punny, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, but since speaking of a mask, I'm using a straw to hide the fact that this is a beer. <laughs> it is actually almost time on a Sunday afternoon. I'm okay. Crank it, breaking it up. It's football time, right? <laughs> That's right. Uh, anyway, that's but that's that's the idea I wanted to throw out to you guys was, um, you know, like, how does being in quarantine, um, how is that revealing our desire to, uh, you know, to to put on a show? You know, how has that been stripped away by by the situation? Hmm. I, I guess I don't know if like I just studied the wrong books in college or what, but. You know, I have this very kind of, um, I don't want to say Machiavellian or Leviathan type perspective on humanity, but I'm just not as impressed by my failures or, or other people's failures the way that, that I used to be. And I don't want to say I lowered my expectations so I wouldn't be as disappointed, but I definitely adjusted my expectations. So there's different social contracts and different settings. So I know certain things are re re required of me here that aren't necessarily required of me there. And yet there comes a point where your home is supposed to be the place where you make up your own social contract. And, and that's where we tend to abuse our freedoms and drop the ball because we don't realize that there is some benefit to having goals, having a plan, having structure, having discipline. Um, not that it's an end in and of itself. You know, it's the whole freedom versus form debate. And I believe uh, in, you know, freedom within form. Otherwise, you don't know what you're looking at. And and what you're trying to uh, even accomplish. So I, I don't necessarily feel like the hypocrite I once felt like, where it's like, oh, gee, you know, I'm a good boy over here, but I'm a bad boy over here. I kind of abandoned that paradigm. And I'm just like, I'm an inconsistent human being. Um, I expend my energy in the wrong places sometimes. And I don't know how to invest it well at other times yeah. and then there are certain areas that i'm like yeah i'm pretty good at this you know like mm -hmm. it's it, it's it's like the people who know you in this camp have a different perspective or or vantage point of you and then the people who know you over here have a different perspective and vantage point of view and yet it's it's all you at the end of the day it's it's the same person um not necessarily uh wearing different hats or playing catch me if you can, but just manifesting differently around different people. Um, so what I've always wrestled with is how come I'm nicest to the people I like the least and meanest to the people I love the most. Like, 
that's and, and that gets into like Paul and like Romans seven, like you know, oh wretched man that I am, you know, like I I I know what should be done, and I actually desire to do it. And sometimes I'm almost convinced that I did a pretty good job. <laughs> But most of the time, I'm just like, am I capable of any real good? Um, I remember listening to a pastor once, and he was just glorying in the gospel in his own life. And he's like, you know, basically, my whole ministry is God fixing the problems I created. Pretty much. (laughs) And he was a successful pastor. Like, he, he wasn't a failure as far as by man's standards or the perception that we had of him, but he was just a humble enough man that was just like, man, I I can't believe God can just keep turning my stupidity Mm. into something useful. Yeah. Amen. Um, Because nobody bats a thousand. I mean, only Jesus did and he didn't even play baseball. (laughs) I think too, like where I, you know, just to jump on what you're saying, I think what I wrestle with is the concept of inauthenticity inauthenticity and for me growing up in the, not growing up in the church um, and then being a convert at the age of 21 and then sort of giving myself wholly into the hands of the church and really embracing um, you know this this discipleship life it was very um You know, it was it was it was surprising to me looking back how quickly I gave myself over to uh, hypocrisy and really playing the role of uh, the Pharisee after I had just after I had just been born again by the grace of God because I was a prodigal who ran away and uh, was living in the muck. And God, you know, comes down and pulls me out of a, a grave and brings me back to life. And then not, not more than two minutes later, I go from being the younger brother to becoming the older brother in the parable and um, and start becoming this horrible hypocrite where I was one person at home, but I was a different person, you know, in front of church folks. And for the last like uh, seven, eight years, I've been trying to figure this out. What does it look like to be authentic and to walk in the freedom of the gospel and be as religious and devoted to God as I really truly am? And, you know, not using, I mean, using the religious word as in, you know, cause it's not a bad word, it's, it, it's true. It means devoted. Um, which I truly am. And yet I know that like you had said, Matt, it is every day, man, I'm a wretch. Why have I not figured this out yet? Why Mm. have I, why am I not lining up my actions and my words with my profession of faith? And I think just what I, you know, I think just being here, being home has helped me see, wow, you know, I, at the same time, I, I've made huge progress in authenticity, but I've also, uh, it does expose kind of the shadow, if you will. And, uh, you know, in our church service this weekend, um, our pastor said, you know, don't waste this moment. Don't waste your quarantine. Don't waste, uh, this coronavirus. you know, look inward and figure out those areas where you know, we need to maybe repent and we need to get back to the basics, if you will, and get back on mission. And uh, and so that's what's happening for me. That's what I'm looking at. But uh, Brian, what are you, what are you uh, wrestling with uh, in your own heart? Um, I think I'm just kind of, I think I'm just running out of excuses yet again, you know, and uh, while it's been good and I've, I've made more time for my family. I've also, it's like Matt was talking about, I I haven't necessarily invested my time. It's like, I know what I need to be doing, but there's still like this, this, this tug of war between what I want and what they want and what my family wants and what I, you know, my time and me and (laughs) you know what I mean? It's like, it's been super nice, but then it's also started getting to where it's like, I, I just, I am kind of, I am running out of excuses, you know, to to avoid spending quality face to face time with them. It's like it comes in waves. It's like I one moment I'm like super aware of what would make me a good father and husband. Mm. And then just like you were saying, two seconds later, I'm like, 
completely forget and then I'm like you know being the very form of God that I, I cringe at to my children you know mm. or to my wife Cat Stevens man the cat's in the cradle you know it's it's scary when you're, you're watching it happen in your own life because mm -hmm. we used to think man I, I'll never be like that yep. and I'm gonna I'm gonna get it right or if not right better yeah and you know sorry to cut you off but no you're good man when you were when you were talking about that that just struck a really deep note in me and because I'm, I'm wrestling processing the death of my own father and he was a good dad um mm -hmm. he really was but he still failed me in a lot of ways and and i'm failing my children in those same ways yeah and uh you know it's like what brian talked about in the first episode about facing your demons um i'm definitely at that crossroad i'm like i'm venturing into a season of life with my family that my own father was never able to cross the threshold of and that's basically being present emotionally engaging them mm -hmm. um, creating a, a constitution a social contract a statement of faith that we all subscribe to and being on the same page as as much as possible for the sake of the tribe um, because there was a fierce streak of, of independence in my father and I, I have that too, man. Like, mm -hmm. my family goes all the way back to the American Revolution. We were talking about you the other uh, night, Matt, and how how you're Scottish. How the Scottish always enjoy a good fight. Hell yeah. You know they got they got a whiskey named after them. You know it's just <laughs> they just they just got a fire in them. and uh, kind of like you know the Fighting Irish and and it's like man, we we all have those genetic streaks in us and. It's it's not all bad, but it's not all good either, <laughs> you know. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, sorry, Brian. That just no, you're good. But I mean, the gospel truly frees us up to be able to admit. It's like that. The whole context of this podcast episode is 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 we sit here and we want to pretend that we're so put together, and when you pretend you're put together, you have a lot of blind spots. <laughs> it's just another idol. It is <laughs> another idol off the old idle factory conveyor belt yeah you know yeah and that and that's why i wanted to have that conversation because it's i knew that we would not the three of us would not sit here and look down our noses at pharisees mm -hmm. I, I i knew that we would talk about how we are that pharisee and how we have that own that own that inconsistency in our own lives and i think if you're a if you're a young believer or maybe you're just coming into the the faith and and you're trying to figure out this whole thing and i think one of the things that i've always struggled with for so many years was why why did it seem like other brothers had it figured out and i didn't yeah and what was wrong with me you know was there something inherently flawed about my own heart you know and and that made me even question my own salvation mm -hmm. and 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 wonder if you know how much righteousness do i actually need to have tangible righteousness in order to be accepted and jesus would say well you have to be your righteousness has to exceed that of the scribes and pharisees and it wasn't until you know not that long ago that i started to understand that you know you have to be perfectly righteous, you know, that uh, that nothing less than 100 percent will be accepted as payment in heaven. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's an alien righteousness. That's why the righteousness doesn't doesn't come from my consistency or my ability to make things better or even be a better dad than I than my father was mm -hmm. or to be successful in my career or to raise, you know, great little Christian kids. Um, that's not that's not my righteousness. My righteousness comes from Christ through faith alone, by grace alone. And um, and I think when when you're faced with the mirror of the law, and you look into the mirror, and, and whether that is you know literally the commandments or you know some scripture um, exhorting you, um, 
that is when we can either look at our our dead bones and we can despair um, or we can become exceedingly righteous and convince ourselves that it's really not that bad we really are doing better than than we think that we are and we can dupe ourselves into believing that um, our righteousness is acceptable before god we lower the bar yeah we lower the bar or there's a third option to completely fall on the grace of Christ and accept his righteousness in our behalf. Mm -hmm. And then I think we can actually, and then it's almost like until you actually die and fall completely on Christ, there's no hope of you actually getting better. Mm -hmm. So I I don't want, one of the things I don't want people to hear our podcast and think is that these guys just give up. Like, oh, we just give up because uh, we know we're, you know, horrible wretches and we can't win the battle. So we just fall down. Well, yeah, we fall down, but then by the grace of Christ and the the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we can actually fight. Mm. We can actually, for the first time in our lives, fight without it being about an image or earning God's love. If we're completely loved and accepted and we have Christ's righteousness, now we can actually make progress in our marriage, make progress in our career and, and it be for the right reason. Yeah, it's when you taste and see that the Lord is good, you get that flavor stuck in your your palate. Yeah. And when you tap into the alien righteousness of Christ, as, as Matt put it, it's just like you had an experience that was like, wow, God is that good. And he has a vision for me to be like him. And he's not this crazy tyrant psycho king, but he made us in his image so that we could be his friends and he actually considers friendship like a form of worship because worship isn't just doing like you know yoga it's it's actually communing with people having a meal with people you know whether you eat or drink or whatever you do um it is it's it's a total like it's the upside down kingdom man i don't know where that term came from but a friend of mine shared it with me and uh, you know, it's 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 the opposite of um, Stranger Things, where it's like, oh, everything uh, on the flip side is is even darker, is even worse. It's like, no, the kingdom of God is even like better than you think. And Jesus really is a good king. He really is benevolent, and he has made a way so that we don't have to be in the the outer courts anymore (laughs) you know we 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 get to go into the holy of holies by the blood of the lamb and we should drop dead but because he made a way and and it is finished um we have this this access that we can have the same relationship that 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 a moses or an abraham or a david had with him um doesn't mean we're going to write our own books of the Bible, but we can have that kind of just intense satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And I wish I could just say I go from glory to glory, faith to faith, grace to grace every day. No, man, like I I have these, these, these wonderful moments of realizing the goodness of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then I go through a super dark season. And I'm like, how does this like make any sense? And yet what God shows me is like, it's so good, Matt, that the darkness cannot shut out the light. And you just look to him in those dark seasons. And sure enough, it's like, he's just as good, even better than you thought. And um, yeah, I I, I know I'm really kind of a, ping pong ball off the table right now bouncing around but I just I don't know it's hard to put into words I mean I know there's there's great uh, theological systems out there that break it down mathematically and academically that I that I agree with and subscribe to and yet I'm trying to just kind of give like the uh, the ethos and the pathos of uh, of what comes with this equation this this formula that God created you know the gospel that um he has released you know into humanity that people are being uh affected by and talking about how it's changed their life and it's like well what do you mean like do you mean like everything's better now like do you mean like 
bad things don't happen as much. Like, what do you mean by that? And it's 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 like coming to this place where, like the Apostle Paul in, in Romans 8, where he's just like, it doesn't matter what you go through. Nothing can separate you from this love. Like, it's that awesome. Like, I've been beat up. I've been thrown in jail. I've beat people up and thrown them in jail. And guess what? None of that can separate you from this. You should try this out. <laughs> <laughs> and you're just like, like what? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And I think that's the thing that um, hopefully is happening across the country as people are realizing that God is good in the midst of and even because of dark times like this. I mean, that is... Um, you know, when the economy fails, when health declines, when our all of our, you know, idols of peace and prosperity suddenly um, are taken away, it's like you realize that that is that is actually an evidence of grace. That is God's mercy toward us, so that we can um, that we can that we can experience. Um, radical forgiveness and grace, and it only comes from having uh, the the facade stripped away. And I think that's the big idea. Is like there's this big fake bull crap, um, it, you know, you know, image that is out there um, that we put out as Americans and Christians. And when that's stripped away, I think we can finally get back to the heart of the gospel. And that is we are, you know, we have nothing to stand on. There's, we have no uh, hope apart from God intervening in the human history. And, um, and, th- and that's good news. Jesus plus nothing equals everything. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 There's a dude that said that back in the day. And um, Matt used to say that all the time. You're the one I'm stealing it from. Yeah. You know, he. Talking about Tolian? We, we, we love. Was he the one who. Yeah. That. And you know, that's a, that's an interesting conversation in and of itself, but it's uh we should get totally in on the episode, by the way. Absolutely. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, I would be seriously, honored. because there's a guy who, who understands that and has like us, you know, failed and even publicly and, and yet is right back out there preaching that message. Because he's like an MMA fighter, and it's like because he lost like a big fight, it's like all these people are like, ooh. And I'm like, <laughs> have you seen this dude in the ring? Yeah. <laughs> like, like I mean, I, I'm not trying to excuse his blunders. Yeah. You know, and, and and all great fighters have a blind side, but you know, it is called the good fight of faith, and people seem to forget like we are engaging, you know principalities and powers um and he he was big in his own circle so you know it's like well isn't that funny about church though is like we want a pastor who can get up there and and pull a joke on himself and kind of say i'm just like one of you guys uh you know i I screw up too sometimes and yet when he actually does screw up then we're like we didn't we didn't didn't want you to screw up that much we just wanted you to screw up a little bit yeah that's way too much like us now (laughs) yeah exactly oh for sure and it goes back to what you were um the principle matt you you had opened up with where it's it's the parable of, of jesus where he's like it's like someone being forgiven a huge debt and then turning around and, and beating someone up who owes them pennies on the dollar. And, and and we just, we have to stop being that person, you know, where it's like, and, and then that, that opens the whole discussion of like, well, then what does accountability look like? What does correction look like? Um, and that's a, that's a valid, worthy discussion, which... I believe is is also a gospel discussion. I don't think anything escapes, you know, the good news. Um, and yet, at the center of the good news is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And we have to remember why that happened, uh, why that was necessary. Yeah. So, I mean, that kind of brings up the the question of, at least in my mind, like, what does a what does the Christian life really look like? Is it is it always like you said? Is it 
uh, just floating around, you know, bouncing from victory to victory, you know, or is it, ah, uh, I'm really just a wretch and, you know, I show up on church and I live my life however I want to live it, um, you know, uh, six days out of the week. And then I come and I get my, res you know, my, uh, my forgiveness of sins. And then I go back out and I, you know, I forget about all that, uh, that just happened. Or is it something in between? What if it is actually really more like a battle mm -hmm. where you're, you're continually, um, writing from the truth of, I am a child of God. I am a priest and a prince in God's kingdom and then you fall into a uh, gross sin where it's almost like you just completely forgot who you were and then you get woken up again and you go back and you go wait wait, wait a minute I am a prince and a priest and I need to I need to act like it and then they fall again to me you know and as far as I can tell from reading through the New Testament it's more like that it's more like a continuous battlefield um, you know, I was watching uh, this great movie. I thought it was pretty good. It was uh, called 1917. Yeah. Um, that story of uh, uh, the guy who, who ran ahead to warn the British uh, army of the, the attack against, uh, against the, the Germans. It was just fascinating because he was, you know, they were living in war. And there's something about that that really does a good job of showcasing the Christian the Christian life uh, to me. I don't know what it was. It was just like because there are like, you can be genuinely comforted by your brothers uh, who are also in the the fight with you, and it's almost like you you can be comforted to such a degree you almost forget that you're in a battle. And then there can be some horrific times when you feel completely alone and you're up against uh, an enemy who you can't possibly outmatch. Mm, yeah. And uh, and I think that's the reality um, that we're living in. That is so funny because I was just watching uh, the the Pacific, um, which you know it's it's a pretty rough uh, Spielberg esque um, depiction of, of of World War Two, and it was that's exactly what it was illustrating like one day you're all a bunch of buds the next day your buds are getting shot the next day you're going out and having a few drinks yep. and you know trying to find a girlfriend and um and i'm just thinking like how confusing of a world that would be to live in because the reality is is a lot of those guys weren't coming home. And yet it was those moments of sanity in between the insanity that made it worth facing the insanity. Like, like they were, they were, they were fighting for those, those shire moments, you know? So they were willing to face Mordor because there was a shire for them to retreat to. Um, otherwise it would just be all quiet on the Western front. And it's just this deep darkness and this deep gloom and life is meaningless. And we're just a bunch of, you know, pigs in a sausage factory that are going to get thrown into the meat grinder and then another pig's going to eat us, you know? And, and that's just a terrible place to be. And yet it's not always all springtime and honeybees and roses. Um, we, we, <laughs> Again, we shift gears and we transition between these these different realities. And I think the wartime uh, paradigm, it's a strong male paradigm. I mean, in the scripture, it, there's all sorts of, you know, poetic allusions in, in the writings of scripture. And there's ones that appeal very strong to the female psyche, you know, a lot of pictures and imageries of you know what being a strong woman looks like that that, that that taps into what women desire and then there's also equally strong ma male illusions and male paradigms where it just is like that really really makes sense to a man because it taps into the things that men instinctually know and desire. And, and yeah, there's a, there's an element of, of, of overlap. I'm trying to, I'm not trying to make like a hard and fast divide. Um, but there, there certainly is 
an appeal um, to these war analogies and and how they really do touch on... Um, Why do you think there's so much war in the Old Testament? All through Israel's history, it is a continual... And even the name Israel, it is a striving with God. Mm. It's a continuous battle. Like everything that we read is nothing goes easy for the children of Israel. <laughs> no. You know, like everything is tooth and nail, you know, scraping for their freedom, fighting against uh, it, the enemies and yet causing some of their own disaster at the same time. It, it The entire thing to me, guys, is like one big analogy for what it's going to be like for you to walk out the faith uh, as a Christian. And I often think that battle or a war is a great analogy because you know it i was just saying to my wife the other day um it's not losing the battle that scares me it's losing the desire to fight and so it's like if for whatever it is to you whatever it is that is your pet sin or your um and the thing that you're struggling with um, in your, you know, whether it's relationship or um, or what have you, it it's it's good enough, I think, in God's sight that you are fighting. And, and I think that's where we get off as Christian in our culture is that we think it has to be all victory. We think we have to stand on top of um, our sin or on top of the culture or on top of uh, you know, the White House and stick a flag in the ground and say, I've claimed this for Christ. And I think Christ is actually more content with us just fighting the battle and, uh, and, and being faithful that way. You're not even allowed on the White House lawn, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> you would be tackled to the ground. <laughs> but uh, that's true. I would like to do it in my boxers, actually. <laughs> <laughs> There's a picture for you. Me playing a flag uh, on the grassy knoll. I'm going to turn that into a meme. <laughs> As the agents are, are swarming around me, ready to tackle me to the ground in my underwear yeah. with the American yeah. flag in front of the White House. I mean, it is a war. You know what I mean? Like, I, I feel like so often we, like, at, at least I'll just speak for myself. For so often... I, I spent so much time fighting paper tigers and sort of fighting and wasting my time fighting for things that didn't matter. And um, and now it's like finding what actually matters and learning to fight for it. And like, it's like when, I, like I fail all the time. Like I, I'm not a good father. And I, I, I try to be though. Like I, 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 I'm always looking for ways that I can improve. You're more self-aware of your failures as well. You, because you understand that there's a higher standard. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so there is a high you, standard. And just to qualify that for our audience, we're not talking about you know you being like the most terrible, despicable human being and your kids should be apprehended from you. Right, I mean, right. We're, no. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about the fact that we're actually listening to our consciences and we're actually listening to the Holy Spirit bearing witness to God's word and truth in our lives. And we're, mm -hmm. we're aware of the fact that, you know what? I, I, I don't love the Lord my God with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my strength. Yeah. And I don't love my neighbor as myself. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't love my enemy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, <laughs> so we're just being honest. And yet we're saying, you know what? But because of Jesus, mm -hmm. he's the hero in the story, not me. I can celebrate his victory because his victory is actually my victory, too. And now mm -hmm. I can actually go on the victory march with him. It says he leads us in triumphal procession. So, like, I don't know why I was invited to this party. But he invited me, so I'm going to go. Yeah. And I'm going to go enjoy the goodness of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So even though I don't deserve to even, you know, be mentioned in the same sentence because of what Jesus has done, you have the hope of actually being a good father. Otherwise, that hope is lost. 
And the best you can do is the charade parade. Yeah. You know? And I'll tell you right now, a lot of those people, yeah. they become complete lunatics. They're pretending. It's just a matter of time before they snap. Yeah. It's unsustainable. And and usually it's it's in the most horrible sorts of ways. Yeah. Um, because we know we're not. Yeah, we know we're not. I, I'm sorry, I cut you off again, Brian. No, I, I you're good, good, man. I always, I mean, that's that's the conversation. Like, you guys I mean, need we're to always going gag back and, and forth. quarter me. <laughs> no, no, you're good. I appreciate what you had to say about that. I mean, yeah. It, it, you know, I, I'm not a, a terrible father. I'm not saying it. You're just a very humble guy, and I want our yeah. I want our audience to know that. Yeah. You know. Yeah. I mean, because because you're you're a better father than I am, and I'm not trying to say, oh, you caught a bigger fish than me, and you know, you're you're just you know, Long John Silver of the seas. <laughs> yeah. The fact that Brian says that he's not a, he thinks he's not as good of a father as he should be makes him a great father and yes. because i'll tell you what he does is he is like repenting in front of his kids and acknowledging failure and he gets back up and he still loves jesus and that is worth ten thousand times uh you know ten thousand catechism questions being taught to your kids like nothing is more valuable mm. than than modeling that sort of humility. Authenticity, like you yeah. mentioned earlier. I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I don't know what to say after that. <laughs> I'm uncomfortable now. <laughs> <laughs> no compliments, please. <laughs> no, but I mean, it, it is. It's, it's like the whole topic that we're even wrestling with right now. It's like, do we lower the standard to fool ourselves into thinking we're doing a good job? Or do we accept the standard that, like, what would perfection, what would me being a perfect parent look like? Never failing, never screwing up. And I always fall short of that. And everyone's always going to fall short of that because the only perfect human has ever been Jesus. But it's like, instead of pretending and instead of and instead of just saying God's law is, is, is meaningless and abandoning it, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, having the gospel allows you to face imperfection in order to step towards more perfection to trust god in new ways you know yeah because he has better yeah. ideas <laughs> <laughs> way better ideas i mean he knows i mean he put it all together so every time i think i'm clever he goes and knocks down my card tower <laughs> once you get past like the sting of failure, you start to see the actually the goodness of the Lord. And you're like, yeah. wow, he wasn't trying to just give me a spanking. Like, yeah. he actually had my best interest in mind. And it's like when you're a kid and you won't eat certain foods because you don't mm -hmm. know what a good steak is and you don't know, like, that there's certain things that are that are better than, you know, Lucky Charms or whatever you're into. <laughs> Brian still eats Lucky Charms. <laughs> <laughs> and God's like, dude, I just carved up, I carved up this steak. You want some? You want to? You want some bacon on that steak? Amen. <laughs> now you're making me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> but that—that's the goodness of of our Lord. And yeah. so, yeah. Then, then we're like, I want to subscribe to this channel. Yeah. But we forget that the way on is is the same as the way in it's like paul in galatians where he's like you started by the spirit mm -hmm. that's that's how you continue you started by faith that's how you continue because because then that's where the old devil plays the old switcheroo on us and wants us to think that it's like well jesus got you in but now that you're in things work a little differently around here <laughs> you know <laughs> oh that's good it's true and we just need to keep trusting him because yeah. we don't know what the F we're doing. Yeah. It's not because yeah. we're he so freaking smart. We figured this thing out. Yeah. And he knew what he was getting into when he, he picked us. The <laughs> thing that I've always respected so much about Lutheran theology, um, when they get, you know, I, I, I don't agree with a lot of the things that they believe, but one of the things that they absolutely get right is a high view of God's law. Yeah. So that it is not swept under the rug, mm -hmm. um, but so that it brings out and, and, and enhances the need for grace, for free grace. And when you have a high view of God's law and you actually believe that God might, he might actually be holy and requires certain 
um, you know, level of righteousness, then you realize that you utterly fall short of it. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing they, they get right is this idea of um, looking outside of yourself for assurance. So we don't look inside and we, we don't look to our works and we look at it as like a checklist that I do enough good things to outweigh the bad things, mm-hmm. right? It's not a matter of um, as long as I'm a Christian and my scales are weighted towards being good versus versus bad. No, 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 no. There are evidences of grace, like you yeah, said yeah. earlier, having that. Yeah, you mean it's not, but it's not about like, it's not about what I do. It's not about my failures. It's not about my uh, victories, even when we have victory. And we do have victories. We have victories all the time. Um, it's not about that. It's about looking outside of ourselves to for assurance. And we look to Christ yeah. because by faith, like you said, Matt, it's by faith that we believe that we are saved and have been justified. Um, and that to me is like, what this whole time really presses on, you know, because we don't have um, people like me who are performers. We don't have the opportunity to perform like I can't go and uh, I can't go to church right now. I can't, um, you know, uh, I can't even go out and, you know, do things in the community. I can't have people over at my house and be hospitable. So my faith is really laid bare before God. And it's really about do am I trusting and looking to him for my assurance and my righteousness. And I feel like, you know, for those who might be listening and just caught up with their own navel, you know, sin and, and nasal gaze, nas- nasal gaze. I mean, if you're nasal gazing, brother, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> the old nasal gazing. Um, uh, but you know what I'm saying? Like, I know there's people who are listening who like me are probably just uh, a, a total basket case about why can I never get it right? And I think God would say, well, that's that's exactly why I don't let you get it right is because I want you to continually yeah. look outside yeah. of yourself, look to Christ. Um, and, and I think that that's a good thing. And then when we do get it right, the occasional time we do get it right, it, it, it's very clear where that came from. <laughs> I was uh, looking one time at that passage about, you know, Jesus being the true vine. And mm. trust me, I'm not going to launch into I have the interpretation of the true <laughs> vine, brothers. <laughs> but but one of the things that Jesus will always say things and I'm like, is anyone actually listening to what he just said? Because that's crazy. Mm. And he makes this comment. He's like, look, guys. I want you to be so like psyched out of your minds, like mm-hmm. stoked, happy, happy, joy, joy about the fact that apart from me, you can do nothing. <laughs> I'm like, wait a second, Jesus, you're telling us that we can do nothing. Why am I excited? Um, <laughs> but, but, but I'm missing what he just said. It's like mm. apart from me. So you're not apart from me anymore. Mm, beautiful. Yeah. Well, I don't think there's um, much better places for us to to wrap up than right there, man. That's a great word. Um, I would just say that um, we're excited about uh, upcoming episodes. Um, We have some cool ideas. And so um, we do have a Facebook page, guys. If you are on Facebook, you'd like to come visit us, uh, please check us out. Look us up, Layman of the Apocalypse podcast. Join Um, the group. Yep, there's a group there as well where you can just lay all of your um, uh, lay it all bare for the for the group and and share your uh, your weirdness with all of us because uh, <laughs> believe me, it's gonna get pretty weird. Um, yeah, yeah. But you can participate in the show, so you can you know throw ideas out that you want to hear in future episodes. Um, you know, just kind of come be a part of the community. Uh, engage with us we'll engage with you and we're not going to be super moderators by the way um we we want <laughs> as we want as uh, diverse a crowd as humanly possible and we we love hearing um you know even contradictory messages we want to hear where you're differing from us we want to hear um if you agree with what we're saying um if not we we love to just model an opportunity to engage uh, in a conversation season with grace. 
um, with you as well. And uh, and share the share the show with your friends. Like if you think this was uh, this was cool and it's an interesting way to spend an hour, then uh, we'd love for you to spread the message and um, and uh, obviously leave us a review on on iTunes. You've, if you listen to podcasts, you know how important that is. So uh, we appreciate uh, you guys tuning in today. Um, any closing words from uh, from I you, just, gentlemen? Yeah, yeah. Thank you for for listening to our our ramblings and our musings. And uh, I hope you're inspired to have meaningful relationships with people in your immediate presence around yeah. the person of Jesus Christ, because these guys are just some of the best friends I could ask for. And they live 3000 miles away. Amen. So go get yourself some uh, gospel friends. Enjoy some good, uh, good adult beverages. Maybe enjoy a cigar. Trust in the grace of God. And we'll catch you guys next time. Peace. Try to catch me howling at the moon. Those bound by the yoke of the law are like servants assigned certain tasks for each day by their masters. These servants think they have accomplished nothing and dare not appear before their masters unless they have fulfilled the exact measure of their tasks. But sons who are more generously and candidly treated by their fathers do not hesitate to offer them incomplete and half done and even defective works, trusting that their obedience and readiness of mind will be accepted by their fathers, even though they have not quite achieved what their fathers intended. Such children ought we to be, firmly trusting that our services will be approved by our most merciful Father, however small, rude, and imperfect these may be. John Calvin